Hello. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, delegates. Welcome to our second day of our meeting. Today, our first program is going to be an exciting one on topic of esophagus and stomach diseases, moderated by first, Professor Jet Holin. Professor Lin is currently the Vice Superintendent Ida Hospital, Kaohsiung, Taiwan. He is also Professor Emeritus, National Taiwan University, Taipei, Taiwan. Honor he is also Honorary President, the Digestive Endoscopy Society of Taiwan, and Honorary President, the Gastroenterological Society of Taiwan. Professor Lin won the award of Marshall and Warren Luminal Gastroenterology Lectureship from Asian Pacific Association of Gastroenterology in 2015. He is now serving as the editor of Gut Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And also, he, Professor Lin is editor of Telepathic Advances in Gastroenterology. Our second moderator today is Professor Jai Yu Kim. Currently, Professor of Internal Medicine at Chung-Ang University, Chung-Ang University of College Medicine, South Korea. And he is also the president of the Korean Society of Gastroenterology. Please give a warm welcome to both of our moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, is the speak okay? Okay, thank you. Um, today, uh, I'm great and uh, of great pleasure and honor to be uh, the chairman of the session. I and Professor Kim will moderate this uh, important section. The first speaker in our section is Professor Sugano. Uh, Professor Jorge uh, Solano, Jose Solano. Professor Jose Solano is the professor of medicine at University of Santa Thomas, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, Manina, the Philippines. His major research interests include chronic hepatitis B and C, hepatocellular carcinoma, and photohypertension. He has been the faculty of several ASEAN Pacific Consensus Guidelines. He is the past president of the APASO. He also the past president of Hepatology Society of the Philippines, Philippine Society of Gastroenterology and Digestive Endoscopy. He is the member of Chronic Hepatitis B Global Guideline Task Force of the WGO. Today, he will give us a talk about the management of refractory GERD. Now we start the lecture of Professor Solano. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this very important meeting towards the end of the year. And I congratulate the organizing committee for this successful meeting. My topic this uh, afternoon is uh, about the management of refractory gastroesophageal reflux disease. And I'll start by uh, asking the question, what is refractory GERD? In the most recent uh, consensus guideline that was uh, published by the European, the American Neuromotility uh, Organizations, they defined refractory GERD as uh, a term that refers to the persistence of symptoms of patients on therapy uh, with prior objective evidence of reflux, meaning that you have erosive esophagitis, uh, peptic strictures, perhaps Barrett's, and you're on therapy and yet you still remain uh, symptomatic. Or in the patients where it's a defined uh, persisting objective evidence of reflux despite medical therapy, hopefully adequate medical therapy, and a continuation of appearances of erosive esophagitis or abnormal acid is, uh, exposures in the esophagus by special testing. So that is refractory GERD according to the joint statement of the uh, European and the American uh, Neurogastroenterology and Motility Societies. So what are the major mechanisms related to 
this refractory GERD uh, syndrome, uh, it's, uh, it can be blamed to persistence of abnormal acid reflux despite PPI therapy, or this is due to reflux hypersensitivity where acidic or non-acidic reflux evoke heartburn symptoms, or heartburn symptoms can be really due to another esophageal disorders like say achalasia, or are caused by other extra esophageal disorders like maybe even uh, referred pain from heart disease, or basically heartburn is functional, not due to any physiologic or histologic abnormality that can be referred to as reflux. These are some of the possible causes of uh, GERD-like symptoms uh, that uh, can confuse con well, uh, physicians. Uh, motility disorders, supraesophageal, sorry, supragastric belching, the rumination syndrome, of course, we know about reflux hypersensitivity in functional heartburn, and sometimes delayed gastric emptying. Certain specific diseases can cause GERD-like symptoms like eosinophilic esophagitis, you may all know that, uh, hypersecretory syndromes like Sollinger ellison a more common phenomenon like pill-induced esophagitis, uh, certain skin diseases that involve esophageal uh, tissue like, say, um, uh, scleroderma, and many other uh, disorders that are written and enumerated in this slide. The pills or the tablets are often uh, a cause of certain symptoms that might be, you know, confused for reflux or persistent reflux despite treatment. And these uh, tablets here or medications that are enumerated in this slide, you need to be able to remember in order for us to help each other in trying to differentiate what is due to reflux disease truly and what is due to some extraneous uh, phenomenon. Um, another enumeration of uh, additional etiologies of refractory GERD can be really misdiagnosis. Of course, the mistreatment for uh, the big acid packet that's involved in reflux disease. And of course, sometimes duodenogastric reflux with bile can also produce symptoms that are not controlled by simple acid suppression. Um, these are additional statements from the same consensus. And what is, I think, important is that the group actually also blamed dilated intercellular spaces as associated with possible symptom generation in patients who are truly with reflux disease, but still uncontrolled by PPI therapy. What are the uh, more common phenotypes of patients complaining of uh, refractory GERD? In many randomized controlled trials, about a third of patients receiving standard dose PPI up to eight weeks uh, will still have either symptom uh, continuation or uh, endoscopic uh, persistence of uh, esophagitis despite the adequate therapy. And uh, this can affect a lot of ethnicities in the world, but I think uh, most of the trials that involve Latino patients seem to pinpoint uh, that particular ethnic group. And clearly reflux uh, that is uh, refractory to the more common PPI treatments that we have are also related to the female gender, obesity, uh, for, the, for those with low BMIs, uh, and of course, IBS, and in patients with uh, major symptoms at night uh, are quite common uh, phenotypes of these patients. That is important to remind that refractory GERD may not be related at all to uh, the absence or presence of Helicobacter pylori. In a recent uh, publication from uh, Pali Hangen, uh, he has determined and uh, suggested to us that really in patients whose symptoms are clearly related to true presence of acid in the reflux head in the distal esophagus, they can be the major generation or generator of symptoms and the role of acid in this particular subgroup of patients will really respond to uh, simple acid suppression. And this is basically uh, what is uh, spoken about in patients with classic reflux. Now, how do you make a diagnosis of reflux based on the clinical manifestations? I think I have enumerated that uh, in the prior slide. But here again, additional uh, characteristics of patients who may not respond to acid suppression are the patients with uh, large hiatal hernias, 
in patients with severe esophagitis uh, when they were first diagnosed. And of course, uh, patients with uh, endoscopic and or radiologic evaluation um, of uh, um, necessary are needed for patients who have refractory reflux. And clearly, in patients uh, with uh, continued peptic ulcerations and peptic structures, especially complications of known uh, acid reflux despite treatment, are all manifestations of refractory during the clinics. Now, in, in these situations, therefore, uh, where patients are hopefully adequately treated with good acid suppression and yet uh, remain symptomatic, the tests uh, that can be made uh, will involve very, very sophisticated examinations. Most of them are seen only uh, in the big centers in Southeast Asia and may not be very accessible to patients in the general population. In order to be able to distinguish true reflux disease or uh, non erosive reflux disease from uh, known clinical entities like reflux hypersensitivity, functional heartburn, um, we need to be able to subject these patients to a 24 hour pH monitoring or to pH impedance therapy or treatments, or maybe even a high resolution manometry. In this table, you will see how to make uh, a diagnosis of these uh, particular uh, syndromes. Uh, they will involve uh, uh, machines and instruments that are, as I, said, as I said, very, very difficult to access and quite uncomfortable and therefore easy for us to give, uh, to mention them in these talks. Uh, nice to be done on patients who have uh, refractory GERD, but clearly uh, in Asia, it might be a little bit difficult. The Lyon consensus for the modern diagnosis of reflux disease basically also emphasizes this particular approach. Uh, in this context, uh, you will see, for example, that uh, in that particular consensus, they recommended that uh, if you are going to use endoscopy as a, a diagnostic modality in establishing true reflux disease, then you'll have to uh, be able to document even more severe uh, esophagitis maybe a long segment barrets uh, or strictures, which are really manifestations of severe acid damage in the distal esophagus already. Of course, if you're gonna use 24-hour pH or pH impedance uh, diagnostic modality, an um, acid exposure time of more than 6% is recommended as diagnostic for true reflux. And in this context, therefore, uh, in the Asian region, uh, this is basically more aspirational than a practical uh, recommendation. Now, when you are faced with certain anatomic, uh, truly true uh, disease disorders uh, in the esophagus that may not be related to reflux, as enumerated in this slide, uh, for eosinophilic esophagitis, for example, uh, for pill-induced esophagitis, uh, maybe a simple in, uh, gastroscopy will be able to make the diagnosis. Uh, if you are entertaining certain motility disorders like achalasia, uh, maybe a high res resolution uh, manometry is important. And of course, in making a differentiation from reflux hypersensitivity or maybe from partial heartburn and impedance treatment, uh, impedance uh, diagnostic uh, uh, exercise will have to be done. Um, in the uh, consensus that was uh, published lately, uh, you can see a very complex uh, algorithm on the diagnosis of refractory GERD. Uh, what is important here is uh, in both either unproved uh, reflux disease or in proven reflux disease that are refractory to uh, uh, PPI treatment, the major next step will be a re-evaluation by endoscopy. And if you look at this particular uh, algorithm, uh, everything emanates from a re-evaluation of the esophagus by endoscopy and then the subsequent uh, specialized testing uh, that have been mentioned in the prior slides in order to be able to uh, arrive at a diagnosis of refractory GERD. Once you have determined that there is uh, a PPI refractory reflux disease, then uh, depending on what the diagnosis will come out from this more extensive examination, you will have to manage them accordingly. 
So how do we treat refractory reflux disease? Um, in that particular uh, joint statement, they said that there, is, there are lifestyle adjustments, there are ways to optimize PPI therapy. Uh, there are also recommendations for adjunctive medical treatment. And of course, even surgical uh, interventions in the patients where you have less uh, response or least response from all these maneuvers. Um, there is, of course, uh, a good value for uh, weight loss. However, uh, there's no clear um, evidence to support that if you stop smoking, you will have uh, less symptoms from reflux and even alcohol in that particular instance. And maybe uh, adopting certain uh, postural adjustments, especially uh, sleeping on the left side or left decubitus position can be helpful. Elevating the head of the bed can be helpful. Um, as you can see in this particular uh, slide, uh, sleeping on the right side uh, might induce more reflux compared to sleeping on the left side where the gastric contents are hopefully lying on the uh, greater curve with the stomach and makes you less uh, uh, prone to reflux uh, when sleeping. Now, we all know how to optimize acid suppression. You can change to a different PPI. You can do double the dose uh, uh, in some instance. And clearly, uh, most of these uh, uh, in randomized control trials have given additional advantage uh, to just once a day PPI. Uh, the subset of refractory patients with persistent esophagitis on EGD or persistent esophageal acid exposure and pace monitoring should be treated with more potent PPI or nowadays even more uh, uh, potent acid suppression in the form of PCABs. Now, adjunctive medical therapies have been already mentioned in the uh, prior publications and major uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines. And here again, uh, we still recommend that you might have to give nighttime H2RAs, uh, maybe antacid, and of course, uh, prokinetic agents are not really uh, of value in this particular instance, and uh, a little bit of advantage in patients who are given baclofen and maybe certain alginates. Um, of course, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can choose which patient might respond to uh, alginates or which patients might respond to baclofen. Now, surgical interventions are, of course, uh, the way to go in case patients are really unhappy with their uh, with their PPI treatments, there are uh, surgical and of course there are endoscopic ways to do this. I think the uh, jury is still out there. Uh, not many well-powered randomized control trials have been made on these uh, on these uh, maneuvers, and therefore uh, it needs a very very long discussion with your patient uh, and maybe in the in those who are really having severe and very uncomfortable uh, refractory symptoms that these uh, interventions will have to be performed. Uh, needless to say, uh, this has to be done in very, very established centers where uh, the experience is quite extensive. This table shows to you the advantages and the disadvantages of the medical, the endoscopy, and of course, the surgical approaches to reflux. I would say that uh, as long as your patients can uh, can be treated and get the relief from symptoms with medical therapy, we have to stick with medical therapy and only go for endoscopic and surgical therapies when the going really gets tough. How about surgery? I think there is a new uh, publication from the New England Journal of, of Medicine which showed to us that in, in a randomized fashion, they compared uh, surgical treatment uh, versus medical therapy and uh, fund duplication seem to have uh, improved uh, the third uh, QL scores by more than 50% in about two thirds of the patients, compared to only about a third of patients who were given omeprazole and baclofen, uh, especially uh, uh, in this context, uh, those patients have been given just PPIs uh, did the poorest. So therefore, this gives you an exciting option and maybe a, a food for thought, whether surgery may be the uh, only way uh, when the patients are not 
really responding to medical treatment. Uh, this can be discussed with your patients, and clearly the decision will have to be mutual. In a uh, accompanying uh, editorial, however, uh, Nitali had some points uh, to, that will make us think twice about surgery. Uh, in his interpretation, uh, the great relief that was achieved by patients uh, who underwent surgery may have some contribution from the placebo effect in surgery. However, because of the long-term follow-up of this particular study, this gives you a bit of credence on really choosing surgery as a pathway. Uh, the only drawback, however, is that uh, even in this particular trial, about a third of the patients who underwent surgery uh, will have still symptoms. And in this uh, subgroup of patients, uh, we really cannot offer anything much after surgery, except maybe further acid testing and then therefore uh, more acid suppression, which really just did not help the patients at all. Um, he emphasized that uh, to think that GERD is really a, a one, one disease uh, and can be treated with, with one approach um, is a really wrong concept and we need to really think more broadly when we are looking at reflux patients, especially in those patients who continue to have symptoms despite acid suppression. Um, we need, therefore, a very personalized medical approach, as well as maybe even surgical approach to these patients uh, and look at the underlying cause of their reflux um, persistence and um, hopefully be able to choose properly the uh, correct treatment that is um, that should be directed to the major etiology of the reflux. So um, in this uh, consensus, they also uh, mentioned that uh, sometimes the psychological factors, uh, as mentioned in this uh, statement at the last part of the slide, can also play a role in the persistence of reflux. And therefore, many of the authorities in reflux today also remind us of the mind-gut uh, connection. Uh, in a review by uh, Carillas, for example, he mentions that uh, when we are treating and making a consultation of reflux in our patients, we seldom think about the psychological aspect and only think about the anatomical aspects in the GI tract. And therefore, uh, today we need to be reminded that in patients with, uh, who have really altered physiology, like a true reflux uh, in the esophagus, true, uh, true uh, really uh, bad functioning lower esophageal sphincters. Maybe in this context, uh, PPS are more effective, but if we are able to recognize that most of the symptoms of these patients who do not respond to PPIs are because of altered perception, then uh, the approach to treatment uh, will be different. The ones on the right boxes will be the first ones that we should consider. Um, as a final slide, I think uh, we need to be uh, able to recognize that uh, the management of reflux disease is not really a one-size-fits-all uh, PPI-focused uh, type of treatment approach. Uh, we need to be able to get a very good investigation historically and physically on these patients so that we'll be able to recognize which patients will have physiological disturbances versus perceptual disturbances. And also, uh, in this context, we should be able to um, have a little bit more of a personalized approach to the treatment of these patients, depending on how we perceive they are uh, being disturbed by their symptoms from reflux. I will conclude by quoting the uh, joint statement in saying that while persisting symptoms are frequently encountered during PPI therapy of esophageal symptoms from GERD, not all refractory symptoms represent, represent refractory GERD. Understanding the epidemiology of refractory GERD as opposed to the symptoms and the pharmacotherapeutics of anti-secretory therapies will help us select the optimal approach to address symptoms and determine the most efficient testing modalities that will help plan the effective management of our patients. And last, of course, along the way, conditions that mimic GERD must be diagnosed and managed accordingly. And refractory GERD is appropriately addressed with optimized medical therapy first before any interventional procedures uh, will be uh, chosen by the physician as well as, of course, by the patient. 
I'm happy to end this talk at uh, this point, and I'll be very uh, glad to answer questions to the Open Forum. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And uh, move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, the Professor uh, Somchai. I will introduce uh, briefly. Uh, professor Simchai is now the uh, professor of medicine uh, at the gastrointestinal division in the Mahidol University, Thailand. And he got uh, many awards from the uh, International Society, and now he is a council member of APAG and uh, uh, director of Motility Center and Sirai Endoscopy Center and uh, many positions. Ne next year, uh, maybe he will be a uh, president of uh, APDW 2023. The title of his presentation is the management, uh, no, Nobel Management of Functional Dyspepsia. Please. Thank you, Professor Kim, for your kind introduction. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Professor Lin and Professor Kim. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to sincerely thank the organizing committee for inviting me to, to join this uh, excellent uh, symposium this morning. My task today is a novel management of the functional dyspepsia. Uh, I did not have any disclosure. So in the next 20 minutes, I will cover the outline of these, these topics. Firstly, to tell the current guidelines and the consensus on management of the uh, functional dyspepsia, and secondly, to uh, realize that the new concept of the pathophysiology of the functional dyspepsia, and last but not least, I would like to demonstrate the emerging management of the functional dyspepsia. As you already known that the distribution of the functional dyspepsia subtype was similar across the countries, uh, about 61% have a postprandial distress syndrome, and nearly 20% have the EPS and one fifth of the patient have uh, overlapping uh, with the PDS and the EPS. PDS is uh, characterized, by, characterized by the mu related symptoms and recognizing as a like, uh, post pandemic symptoms such as uh, pain and uh, uh, burning, and also the bloating and the belching and the nausea and weight loss are a part of the dyspeptic symptom, but not uh, for the vomiting and symptom and of heartburn and IBS are independently associated with all the functional dyspepsia subtypes and especially for the overlapping group. Uh, our study in a patient who have a functional dyspepsia, more than 3,400 cases, also show that the overlap with the uh, functional GI disorders such as a heartburn and globus and bloating and diarrhea and constipation and as well as IBS. My study uh, in the functional dyspepsia, more than 4,000 uh, patients also show that they have an overlapping with the gastroesophageal reflux disease, nearly 50%. So what is the new purpose of the pathogenesis of the functional dyspepsia? You will see that uh, they have mentioned about the gut brain axis dysfunction and also the alteration in the bile acid pool and also the imbalance of the gastrointestinal bicomiota and also the duodenal immune alteration and the low-grade mucosal inflammation and also the sensory and motor function of the gastrointestinal tract. Mainly, the new proposed pathogenesis is focusing on the gut brain axis dysfunction and also the duodenal low-grade mucosal inflammation and also the immune alteration. So all drugs that can make a a benefit to, uh, to the functional dyspepsia is a uh, usual in the green box and uh, the, the solid line is a, a, a form the data of the randomized controlled trial and uh, the dash line is a form the non-randomized controlled trial. You will see that the neuromodulator drugs can alter the brain processings and the prokinetic drugs uh, have a, a randomized controlled trial show about the gastric dysfunction and also the acid suppression we will be benefit, especially in the patient who have an overlap with the gastroesophageal reflux disease, and also the might be have a, a some benefit because uh, the duodenal gastric overload and also the sensitivity and the barrier defect. 
the long-term PPI, as you already heard uh, from yesterday, that uh, we have a changing in the intestinal uh, dysbiosis. And also the new uh, concept about the eosinophil and mast cell activation, the low of the histamine, uh, not only the H1, but also the H2 receptor antagonist might be a benefit in this group. Also the leukotriene 1R antagonist, and also the selective antibiotics and the probiotics might be uh, might play a law for the intestinal dysbiosis. From the recommended uh, international guideline and consensus around the world, uh, I uh, gather about at least five uh, international and consensus that are talking about the current recommendation of the functional dyspepsia for the first right treatment, mainly is focusing to the PPI. Uh, Thailand also uh, mentioned about the PPI, maybe uh, consider about the prokinetic drugs, and the Japanese guideline also mentioned about the the prokinetic drug. Uh, the, not a new one, but the the, the only available in some countries uh, such, because of this is uh, eco GMI is a a launch uh, from Japan and also uh, available in India, but not so many countries in Asia available. And uh, Likunchuto, which is a, a herbal medicine. And the British uh, society also mentioned about the PPI and might be considered about the H2IA and the prokinetic drugs. For the second line management, the five guidelines also mentioned mainly is focusing on the tricyclic and the patient. Uh, Thai guidelines also mentioned about the cytoprotective agents and uh, some might be uh, mentioned about not only for the TCA, but uh, the uh, 5-HT1A receptor antagonist such as the tandospirone uh, may be effective and also the herbal medicine other than Rikunchuto, which is a herbal medicine from the Japanese guideline. And also the tandospirone and picabulin and mirtazapine, which is a tetracyclic and the, the percent also mentioned in the British society guideline. So the target being cut, uh, you can have a TCA or tetracyclic and the percent SSRI might be play a role in some study uh, the, 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 the less it will be have a chance to be an emerging uh, for the management. Tandospirone now is uh, uh, newly listed in the uh, Rome 4 criteria, and Buspirone is already known about maybe 10 years ago, Gabapentin and P. Gabalin. So, in the study from the Tandospirone uh, recently also showed that uh, when you uh, look at the functional dyspepsia and you randomized control and try in the placebo group uh, 55 patient and tandospirone 60 patient and see what's going on. You will see that uh, the gastrointestinal symptom score and the uh, Hamilton anxiety score have a reduction uh, significantly uh, in the tandospirone group, but not in placebo group. And also for the expression of the inflammatory cytokine, you see that the D BDNA. NF and interleukin 10 and interleukin 6 have a B4 in the white bar and uh, after management in the in the black bar uh, change significantly in BDNF and interleukin 10 and 6, but not a TNF out, alpha. So in this study also show that a tender spiral effectively improve uh, both anxiety and gastrointestinal symptom in patient functional dyspepsia, especially who uh, uh, moreover, also have an association with the modulation of the P BDNF and also inflammatory cytokines. A, another one, uh, another 5 uh, uh, serotonin 1A receptor agonist for the functional dyspepsia, which is uh, already uh, uh, have done by Jan Chak uh, 10 years ago, also showed that uh, uh, buspirone compelling with the placebo also showed the benefit in the post. Uh, pandial fullness and the bloating and also the early satiation significantly. And for the gabapentin and picabalin, you see that the picabalin uh, from uh, six randomized control and try uh, significant show the effect that um, uh, the more than placebo in treating the anxiety and GI symptoms. Uh, the study from the Elanian group uh, showed that in a patient who have a refractory uh, functional dyspepsia, when you uh, randomize uh, to the two groups, the first group, the 63 patient received uh, the omeprazole, another group, the 63 patient as well, uh, also received the omeprazole plus gab gabapentin. Uh, this uh, Two groups also show that the reduction of the total uh, gastrointestinal symptom score in the patient who have 
uh, received the uh, gabapentin more significantly comparing with the placebo group. So the gabapentin as an adjunctive drug could be more effective for reducing the severity of the GI symptoms in this peptic, uh, especially for the neurological symptoms. For the, the p gabalin uh, which I already mentioned, we have a sick randomized controlled trial, the, the newest uh, randomized controlled trial from uh, Chiang Mai group in Thailand, uh, Dr. Tanet, also showed that uh, in a patient who have a refractory functional dyspepsia, when you uh, prescribe the p gabalin and uh, the placebo group, uh, in each uh, p gabalin is a 34 uh, patient and 38 for receive placebo for the p gabalin 75 milligram a day or placebo for eight weeks. We see that the responder between group in the week two, week four, and week six, and week eight, uh, the week four to week eight have a show statistical significantly. Moreover, for the uh, global overall symptoms reduction, uh, they also show that uh, in p gabalin group, uh, have a more reduction in the global symptom uh, overall uh, significantly compared with the placebo. So uh, picabalin might be elevated of the dyspeptic symptom, especially in the patient who have a predominant epigastric pain. For the prokinetic drugs, you already know that the uh, study from Lapat uh, from Chulalongkorn, uh, Thailand, also showed that uh, uh, from systematic liver meta-analysis, the 29 randomized controlled trial, uh, mainly uh, is a low quality evidence, have a number needed to treat about seven, including the cisapply, ELCO, GMI, etopi, and mosapi, and tecacilot. So uh, not only the PDS, but also the EPS also show the benefit uh, from the, uh, using the prokinetic drugs. So for the prokinetic drugs, even though uh, the very low qu uh, quality of evidence, prokinetic drugs are well tolerated in a short-term treatment duration and effective in re reducing the pep dyspeptic symptom in all subtypes with number needed to treat about seven. And uh, both Western and Asian countries also have a short sure benefit, but uh, Asian population may respond better than uh, the Western country with the number needed to treat about five and 10 respectively. For the ECOGMI, which we will which have launched from the Japanese group uh, since uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this is a mass colonic antagonist and cholinesylis inhibitor. The first study also showed that uh, uh, double bright placebo control trial, nearly 1,000 patients uh, showed that the echo GMI have a global improvement about 52 comparing with the placebo about 35. And the recently last year also showed that the, the systematic review and meta-analysis of the echo GMI, you will see that the, the improvement in the symptom of the functional dyspepsia after management of the echo GMI was higher than the placebo, but this is not statistically significant. So, and, and the adverse effect did not differ between two groups. So in this systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, we summarized that the echo GMI seems to be a promising agent in the functional dyspepsia. However, further study needed to be elucidated that the, the low of the echo GMI in functional dyspepsia. The acid suppressing therapy, PVI already mentioned about that, H2IA have a seven studies show have a some benefit. And how about the histamine two, uh, two and histamine one blocker combination concerning duodenal low grade inflammation it's a newly emerging target that may also uh, respond to the histamine and leukotriereceptor uh, blocker in addition to the PBI. And how about PCAPs? You already heard from Professor Ken Sugano yesterday that uh, PCAP, I think, uh, might do not have uh, any uh, evidence about the dyspepsia, but I think maybe not different uh, from the, uh, the benefit should be not different from the PBI. PBI uh, even use a low dose of the standard dose, it equally, but not recommend to use the high dose of the PPI and the two to eight weeks of the PPI uh, have a show the relief of the overall dyspeptic symptoms about uh, the, by using by looking at the number needed to treat about 13 and PPI also have a slightly benefit uh, uh, more than uh, H2IA and poor kinetic drugs uh, for the overall dyspeptic symptoms which have a number needed to treat about 13 and 20 uh, respectively. 
duohistamine bucket study from a, a Nick Charlie group also show that electrospective study uh, for 14 adults using the H1 and H2 by using the linitidine and rolatidine uh, for a median period, about four months, uh, by assess the, the clinical response using the physician, uh, physician assessment. They show that uh, the symptom improvement in about uh, 71%, and one out of 10 report to complete uh, symptom relief, and nine out of 10 have a partial symptom uh, relief Moreover, you will see that uh, in responder and in non-responder, the mean EO synophilic count expressed uh, per square uh, millimeters in patients with the functional dyspepsia who did not and who did respond to the dual histamine bucket uh, have a promising that have a show that have a more prominent in responder uh, comparing with the non-responder. For the anti-inflammatory rest therapies, the drug that is not available in the U.S. market, like such as lebamipai, which is available in the in the our Asian country and from uh, the Japanese group and the Korean groups, so you also show that the lebamipai, which is a a prostaglandin synthesis enhancer, also show that uh, in the, the systematic review and meta-analysis in a functional dyspepsia, about thirty. 3% of the patients who add on with the lebamipai might have a dyspeptic symptom improvement. So in Thai guideline, we also state that uh, the prokinetic agent and TCA and positive agent have been shown to improve symptoms in patients with the functional dyspepsia after failure of the PPI therapy. About the do you know dysbiosis, the discontinuation of the PPI in patients without a clear evidence benefit to target dysbiosis should be done. Probiotics and antibiotics. You will see that uh, in eradication of the HP eradication, have, and also the patient have improved in the symptoms. The effect was uh, looking at the, all of the antibiotics was uh, promising in the, using the metronidazole group, uh, such, uh, especially if the patient have a microscopic duodenitis. And how about the lifaxamine? You will see that uh, the pro probiotics by using the daily yogurt uh, for 12 weeks, which is uh, composed of the lactobacillus casilis uh, in the PDS group and EPS group. In the PDS group, have a, a 10 of the benefit because uh, the, the p-value is marginal benefit and the EPS group is they have no statistical significance. So it have positive uh, overall effect on the classic symptom in the uh, PDS, but not in the EPS. And also another study using the bacillus coagulans and bacillus uh, subtilis for eight weeks and see that uh, what is the uh, uh, symptom improvement by using the postpandemic distress syndrome score and scale. And uh, in a patient, uh, about uh, more than 30 uh, patients in each group, uh, they conclude that uh, using the uh, bacillus coagulans and bacillus subtilis more uh, efficacious and safe uh, in the treatment of the functional dyspepsia. So, we need uh, to uh, have a more data that uh, which stain and which uh, uh, population and uh, single stain or multiple stain or uh, the volume of the, 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 the strain, which one is, will be better or benefit to the functional dyspepsia. For the live facts, I mean, uh, the data randomized control try uh, 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 in the patient who have a functional dyspepsia in the live facts, I mean, I'm about 40 and a possible about 46. And looking at the benefit by using the lifaximine about two weeks and eight weeks later, looking at the cobalt dyspeptic symptoms and also the belching and the postprandial bloating, especially in the female, uh, two weeks of the lifaximine have an adequate relief of the cobalt dyspeptic symptom, belching and postprandial fullness and bloating, especially in the female gender. So about the non-pharmacological therapy, uh, many uh, studies show that the low FODMAP might be have some low gluten free and CGS product, elimination diet, and low fat and food intolerance and food uh, additives. And also the multidisciplinary teams, such as uh, psychotherapy, mindfulness based uh, therapy, and hypnotherapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, the herbal medicine, which I will not mention in this study, have so many, many studies show that have a benefit in the uh, a functional dyspepsia as well, and also the acupuncture and electrical stimulation. Uh, this table also showed that uh, for the non-pharmacological method in management of the functional dyspepsia, you will see that uh, many methods uh, show the efficacy is uh, ranging from 
40 uh, percent to nearly six uh, to nearly 90 percent, uh, such as uh, the actual land, uh, the psychotherapy, the food, uh, the medical food, uh, such as colorway, colorway oil or peppermint oil, uh, the acupuncture and the electrical stimulation, but. Uh, should be aware and concerned about the high possible effect of the functional dyspepsia that is ranging from 30 to 60 percent. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize that the major functional dyspepsia subgroups uh, post-pandial dyspepsia syndrome and the epigastric pain syndrome. And PDS is the most prevalent subgroup but often, often uh, overlaps with the EPS and frequently coexists with the other functional GI disorder. Uh, the duodenal mucosal hyperpermeability and locate duodenal inflammation have been associated with the other neuronal signaling and systematic immune activation in the functional dyspepsia. And recognition of the subtle pathology in functional dyspepsia may, let, may lead to the discovery of the new uh, potential biomarker and therapeutic uh, target uh, ultimately contributing to the diagnosis and treatment. And last but not least, future classification uh, should include the markers of underlying pathophysiology to allow uh, to, to target the rather than symptoms-based therapy and to identify the subgroup that respond to a specific intervention. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, next year, we will have an APDW in Bangkok. Uh, please set the date uh, December 6th tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And now we are going to proceed to the last speaker. And the last speaker is Professor Kentaro Sugano. I make a, a brief introduction for Professor Sugano. Professor Sugano was the resident research associate at Tokyo University Hospital and a visiting researcher at UCLA and University of Michigan between 1982 to 84. He was promoted as the chief professor department of gastroenterology, Jichi Medical University from 2014. Currently, he is the professor emeritus, Jichi Medical University. Between 2009 to 2014, he was the president of JSGE. Between 2014 to 2018, he was the president of APAGE. And in 2016, he was the Congress president of APDW in Kobe, 2018 to 2021. He was the president of APDWF. He won the JGHF Marshall and Warren Lectureship Award in 2016. Today, we're happy to have his talk, the new, the key new concept in Ballet as Vargas. Professor Sugano, please. Thank you, Professor Lin, for your kind introduction. And I also appreciate uh, organizers, especially Professor uh, Vilay Kaur and uh, Professor Dalocha Mahachai for providing me this opportunity to explain the key new concept in Barrett esophagus. And uh, this was actually uh, uh, made me possible to use the uh, surplus money after Kobe meeting. So we invite all the uh, uh, important uh, key opinion leaders across the Asian Pacific country because it's APDW money and probably Professor Somuchai can use uh, a good use of the extra amount of money if uh, he get the surplus <laughs> out from the APDW 2023. Anyway, uh, if you want to establish or understand new concept, you have to uh, learn from the uh, lessons uh, from the past. As Professor Lin is quite uh, aware, Confucius is a Chinese philosopher. 
more than 24, 25 years, thousand, 2,500,000 2, years ago, uh, long before uh, Christ. He said, the master means Confucius, if a man keeps cherishing his old knowledge, so as continually to be acquiring new, then he can be a teacher of others. So this is the lesson we learn from Confucius, probably uh, Professor Lin and uh, our Japanese learn his lesson from an uh, analect of Confucius, which is still keep uh, uh, being published in Japanese language as well as Chinese language, I think. <laughs> so I'll start my talk with the uh, history of Barrett esophagus. This person, Norman R. Barrett, Rupert Barrett, is the thoracic surgeon born in Australia, and he's educated. He's uh, born in a wealthy family in Australia, and uh, he, his family sent him to the uh, United Kingdom, uh, St. Thomas, uh, to learn medicine. And uh, he published this famous paper in 1950, uh, saying that the uh, peptic ulcer of the esophagus represent gastric ulcer. This is a famous mistake, actually. And he thought the peptic ulcer, shown here, uh, represent the uh, uh, gastric mucosa because of the uh, shortened esophagus. And this is a congenital defect. So this is a very famous mistake. And uh, he mentioned this also occurs in the gastric mucosa uh, pulled up into the esophage esophageal tubes. But however, uh, the contemporary, another very famous uh, thoracic surgeon, Sir Philip Roland Allison claimed he made a mistake because the, uh, this part of the uh, ulcer is not from the uh, stomach, but from the esophagus because there is a squamous island remain in this part. That means this part may represent esophageal mucosa. And also more definite evidence is the submucosal esophageal gland. This is a definite uh, uh, evidence for this part belong to the esophagus. And also he pointed out there is no parietal cells, which is a signature of the stomach epithelium. And also peritoneal coverage means the stomach part should be covered by the uh, uh, peritoneum, but not this part. So, this strong argument actually uh, clearly demonstrates this also occurs in the esophageal mucosa, not gastric mucosa. However, both are, are wrong actually, because the, uh, this uh, first description of peptic ulcer of the esophagus was done early on the 20th century. This is the uh, Boston pathologist actually published this paper, but uh, people ignored. And Allison didn't aware of this uh, paper either. So they call, uh, he called the uh, peptic ulcer of the esophagus show is uh, Barrett ulcer. And then uh, Barrett ulcer stand alone and then become widespread. And by the way, this uh, uh, Pro Professor Allison, also the first person to uh, recognize uh, reflux esophagitis concept. But this is, uh, and then finally, a similar harsh argument between these uh, two groups and others involved. Uh, finally, the uh, Barrett accepted his mistake and uh, as summary uh, 
imagined it is suggested that the lesion under discussion should be called the lower esophagus, lined by columnar epithelium, and it is probably the result of a failure of embryonic lining of the gullet, gullet means the esophagus, to achieve normal maturity. He again made a mistake. This was a congenital defect, which is uh, not really uh, uh, true. And uh, in a 1996 paper by famous uh, authority by Speckler, shows that both Barrett and Allison assumed the columnar epithelium of the esophagus was congenital in origin, which are not true now. And neither Barrett nor Allison require the presence of intestinal metaplasia or minimal length of diagnose this condition. This is important to remember. Acquired change of the esophagus into columnar epithelium was indicated first by Merch at all in 1959. So uh, current Barrett concept is, uh, it was not established by Barrett himself. And Allison is partly right, but uh, not truly, really, because they thought the defect is, was a congenital. So the, uh, he mentioned the uh, father argue that continued use of this outmoded, that means Barrett esophagus, and the potentially misleading term should be discouraged. And another uh, Jordanian uh, surgeon mentioned further, due to landmark contribution of Philip Allison towards the core concept of this concept condition, we believe that if an eponym's term should be attached to this condition, it should bear Allison's name and not Barrett. <laughs> he is correct, I think. I agree with him. But uh, another person uh, stick and, uh, to this name, and uh, he is the Australian surgeon uh, because he supports uh, Barrett, of course, because of the uh, same country. And, uh, the and also, I partly agree with him because Barrett esophagus is so prevalent these days, so integrated into medical literature, so uh, people can easily understand uh, this condition, but uh, there are not, you know, a lot of misunderstanding in the minor part. But at least uh, this is a convenient umbrella term. In a sense, they may be included in the overall term Barrett esophagus as any area of histological columnar metaplasia in the tubular esophagus, regardless of length, regardless whether it is visible macroscopically, and regardless of whether intestinal metaplasia is present or absent. This is an important notion, I think. And uh, so we still keep using Barrett esophagus under the uh, concept of uh, Professor, Professor Lowe's uh, proposal. And but uh, there are a lot of, you know, uh, discrepancies. People do not learn from the uh, lessons from the past. For example, there are a lot of international guidelines about the definition of Barrett esophagus. For example, American College of Gastroenterology ignored uh, uh, Professor Lowe's mention that they require in intestinal metaplasia for defined Barrett esophagus and the length uh, limitation is over one centimeter. This is totally against Professor Lowe's concept, okay? And AGA abandoned length definition, but still required presence of uh, intestinal metaplasia. APH are similar to the ACZ, but uh, do not require intestinal metaplasia, just like BSG, British Society Guideline. And the Japanese Society Guideline is quite aligned with Professor Lowe's proposal, we don't require any uh, limitation in the length and no requirement for the presence of uh, intestinal metaplasia. Another important difference is uh, 
where to set the uh, junction between stomach and esophagus. There are huge difference among the uh, other international guidelines uh, uh, compared to the Japanese uh, society guidelines. So uh, this uh, kind of differences brought a lot of confusion in terms of the epidemiological studies and pathophysiological studies and treatment. So we convened using the uh, surplus money out from the Kobe meeting, uh, we has hosted Kyoto International Symposium in 2019. We invited a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, opinion leaders across the uh, Asian Pacific. And also we asked uh, pathologists to come in and join us together to uh, discuss all the uh, aspects and Professor uh, John Speckler is here and Chandra Soma is here, and Keo Go, Ken Falk and Professor Mahachai and uh, Professor Vujie and all others are involved. Joe is also here. So the first I'll uh, talk about the landmark of the gastroesophageal junction and this is important for a clinical purpose. Where to decide? How to determine the gastroesophageal junction? This is, uh, causes a lot of you know, problems. Length uh, definition requires where, where, where to start esophagus and where to uh, discriminate esophagus versus stomach. And in endoscopically, there are several landmarks actually uh, used. Proximal end of uh, gastric holes here. And the Japanese guideline uses palisade vessels. This is fine vessels you can see all around the esophagus. And other uh, might use a scrum columnar junction, so-called Z-line. However, in a regular normal uh, person, this proximal end of gastric folds and palisade vessel coincide with each other. So there won't be any problems. However, in a practical uh, sense, it is sometimes difficult because if you uh, inflate the terminal esophagus by air too much, that stand the esophageal lumen and then press down the uh, gastric folds and some of the gastric folds like this one disappears. So it, it, it's sometimes difficult. So it's flattened and uh, also uh, it's extend the surface area and uh, there is a clear separation from uh, a squam columnar junction and the uh, end of the proximal, proximal end of the gastric fold. So uh, this Gastric fold is an unstable uh, landmark, whereas the uh, distal end of uh, uh, palisade vessel are stable anatomically. And if you suck up the air too much, the end of esophagus can fold, a uh, falls, and sometimes uh, if you look at this part or this part, you may think that the end of the gastric fold might involve esophagus. So if the uh, columnar metaplasia occurs in this distal part of the esophagus, you can discriminate uh, this part might belong to the uh, stomach or esophagus. So uh, the air, amount of the air in the distal part it's very important to uh, uh, clearly, you know, identify uh, the end of uh, gastric folds. Whereas the distal end of palisade vessel has a solid anatomical uh, basis because uh, this uh, vessel structures take place because of the sphincter is there and uh, to avoid sphincteric constriction by the uh, sphincter function, 
this uh, blood flow avoid muscle part and then go to the uh, submucosal area and uh, therefore this is the anatomical uh, landmark and you can clearly identify the uh, this uh, vessel structure uh, either white light or even uh, in bi images and also if you look at histology this is a more uh, solid, uh, I think, uh, uh, marker for uh, esophageal mucosa. You can see uh, palisade vessels, which is a relatively large uh, vessels here. And then uh, esophageal gland is attached to this part. So this really represents esophageal part. And, uh, even there is some squamous island remain, you can identify the uh, uh, palisade vessels here. Double muco musculus mucosa take place sometimes in the Barrett esophagus, and they represent the esophageal part. Again, you can see a palisade vessel here. So this has a solid histological evidence that this uh, palisade vessel belong to the esophagus. And another evidence is the endoscopically, the uh, palisade vessel is superior to the gastric folds. However, one weak point is that if inflammation is taking place, the, uh, that obscure the, uh, the palisade vessel because of the thickened squamous epithelium and also inflammation obscured the uh, identification of palisade vessels. In that case, it, you, you, you might have to use the end of uh, gastric folds. So this is the summary and the anatomical validity palisade vessel is superior and positional consistency is better. And however, it can be unstable in the uh, inflammatory conditions. Gastric fold lacks this anatomical validity and consistency. However, it is easier because it's much thicker than the parasite vessels. So our consensus uh, guideline actually mentioned the uh, anatomically distal end of parasite vessel is more appropriate than proximal end of gastric fold for defining the junction. And uh, however, in clinical con consideration is also offered. The clinically, if the distal end of parasitic vessel is clearly identifiable, it should be used for defining gastroesophageal junction. In case, uh, however, the parasitic vessels are not identifiable, then proximal end of gastric fold should be used as a landmark. So the, in that particular case, you can use uh, end of gastric fold as a landmark. And again, uh, how to practically you know, implement that to, uh, to identify distal end of parasitic vessel? Uh, there is several statements, uh, white light imaging, both forward and front, but the most important part is the appropriate amount of air should be insufflated. Too much air uh, is uh, unnecessary or too much suction will uh, for, give a false, you know, uh, fold con conformation of the esophagus. And how about the uh, intestinal metaplasia? It, it's uh, time over now. So, I, so if you want to identify intestinal metaplasia, you have to take a lot of biopsies, at least seven biopsies are necessary, which is impractical in a sense. And another one is that uh, even if you don't have intestinal metaplasia, simple columnar epithelium is uh, uh, the background mucosa of the small esophageal adenocarcinoma. So intestinal metaplasia is the risky condition. However, even columnar epithelium has a risk of, uh, of the uh, adenocarcinoma uh, development. And the same for this, without any metaplastic columnar epithelium, uh, 
there is a clear evidence that the adenocarcinoma uh, occur. And the same for this. And the length lim limitation, this is uh, still an uh, ambiguous area because the, uh, in a regular endoscopic observation, uh, that ultra short barrett esophagus is a sort of unstable uh, diagnosis so far because uh, the use of landmark uh, is uh, not unified. It is so another important concept is that we tentatively established gastroesophageal junction zone, which is uh, one centimeter across the uh, junction, both oral and uh, uh, distal, which is a uh, revision of the cerebral type two uh, concept. Uh, which is uh, one centimeter from the plexmile side and two centimeters of the uh, gastric side. But if you accept several type two concept, there are some contamination from true gastric cancer to this uh, you know, junctional you know, gastric cancer, uh, junctional adenocarcinoma. So we tentatively shorten the gastric side uh, once by one centimeters. The major reasons for this uh, concept is that diagnostic inconsistency, as I showed you, and the limited extent of cardiac type of mucosa. I skipped all the uh, discussion of the cardiac type of mucosa uh, because it is difficult to under, you know, identify cardiac type of mucosa, uh, which is, should be separated from uh, true oxyntic mucosa. And this part was shown to be a relatively low risk in developing gastric cancer, as I show you here. So we still need some more concept, but conceptually, I think uh, the uh, proximal side of one centimeter should belong to the direct esophagus. So the uh, new concept of definition of direct esophagus is like this. Barrett esophagus is the condition in which metaplastic laminar mucosa predisposed to neoplastic neoplasia replaces a squamous mucosa of the distal effect. That means laminar metaplasia, no requirement of intestinal metaplasia, elevated risk of neoplasia, and distal esophagus without uh, uh, length criteria because there is an inlet part in the proximal esophagus. So the, now we really start in the start line, a line all together, and the new diagnostic and pathology of youngster research really start from now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sugano. We are moving to discussion, uh, but uh, uh, we are running out of time. Just uh, one or two questions. Uh, Somchai and Sugano, uh, I invited speakers to the podium. And uh, Soyano is not available right now. Okay. Uh, Professor Somchai, I have a question on, online. Uh, what is the best treatment in patients with uh, functional dyspepsia overlap with the GERD that resistance to the PPI? <laughs> Can you answer me? Another? Repeat? Okay. What is the best treatment in patients with the functional dyspepsia overlap with the GERD that resistant to the PPI? Uh, I, I think uh, we, we need to uh, look at the symptoms that uh, if the patient have an uh, overlap with the GERD and uh, they should have uh, some uh, not response to, to the PPI very well. We need to see that. Firstly, I, I will check a look that uh, if they have any partial response to the PPI or not. If they no no any response, maybe we have a chance to change because uh, the data from Thailand and also from the Asian country also show that majority of the the overlapping with the uh, the the reflux maybe have a non erosive reflux disease. So uh, in this patient, if you switching to another PPI, it might help in some condition. But uh, in the European and also in the uh, Western countries, 
might be helpful uh, another like uh, uh, increase uh, the, 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 the response rate. But uh, if you're changing uh, to the other PPI or increase the dosage of the same PPI, like a double dose, and it not, did not respond very well again, so I will consider about the, the, the other cause of the, uh, not only the functional dyspepsia, but maybe have uh, some overlapping with other uh, condition. And we have to consider about such as some, like a tricyclic antidepressant or anything else uh, uh, in that condition. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, Yano, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Jay. Thank okay, you. Okay, nice to meet you again. Yes, and, nice to uh, see you. Looking yeah. good. Uh, 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 one question. In refractory guard, which one is the better between high dose PPI or a PK? <laughs> But I think a high dose PPI has been tried for some time now, maybe twice a day PPI has been tried and it gives you about 10-15% additional benefit. But I think the recent data on the PCAPs, especially in severe esophagitis, for example, uh, that is refractory to PPIs, you have uh, additional advantage by using PCAPs. And yesterday I think uh, Ken also uh, spoke about the benefit of tecoprasan on nerd patients and therefore in these two uh, potential patients, populations, then maybe a pickup will be better than high-dose PPI. Okay, thank you. And the uh, last question is Professor Sugano. Uh, which is the best way to prevent cancer development in barred esophagus patient? Uh, yeah. Which is the best way to prevent cancer development in barred esophagus patient? Yeah, cancer development. I think the uh, best evidence so far is that the uh, use of the uh, PPI together with the uh, low-dose aspirin was properly published in New England Journal of Medicine, and it reduces the development of uh, cancer by 30%. But uh, now we are moving into the PCAB era, so PCAB might be another option. But uh, long-term you know, use of PCAB have some concern about the uh, hypergastrinemia or development of gastric cancer. So we have to wait another evidence. Okay. Uh, sorry, we are running out of time. We have uh, many questions, uh, but uh, uh, personal content. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, now uh, we are closing this session. Uh, thank you very much, so Soyano and Sugano and Somchai and uh, the active participant. Thank you very much.